Good afternoon. I'm Tashaka Cunningham, the Associate Director of Scientific Collaboration for DIA. And I'm here today with my guest, uh, Mr. Sam Kulkarni, who's the CEO of CRISPR Therapeutics. And we're going to talk a bit about uh, your company and its technology and what you're doing to advance uh, patient care. So first question I have for you, Sam, what are the main uh, technical challenges involved with developing therapeutics based on gene editing, like your company's doing? Yeah, thank you, Shaka. CRISPR gene editing has captured the imagination of, of researchers and the public worldwide. Uh, and the reason for that is CRISPR is such a versatile tool that you can do many things with it. You're actually trying to treat diseases at the fundamental DNA level by either disrupting genes, adding genes, or regulating genes. With that sort of versatility, uh, you have to bring these therapies in in a very safe and high quality manner as you bring them through the clinic and into two patients ultimately. Uh, there are some technical challenges that are sort of the early technical challenges, which I think have largely been addressed, which is around off-target editing and on-target editing to make sure that you're making the edits you want to make at the target, but nowhere else in the genome. And that's this phenomenon known as off-target. And by using industrialized approaches and robust algorithms, I think we've largely solved that problem. Beyond that, you have different challenges for ex vivo and in vivo therapies. For ex vivo therapies, you're essentially taking cells out of the patient or from a healthy donor, manipulating those cells and reintroducing the cells as a therapeutic. In those cases, one of the key challenges to overcome is sort of the, the manufacturing aspects of it. You want to ensure high quality manufacturing because these are living drugs. You're essentially reinfusing cells which can grow and expand within your body. And for that, we ensure highest quality manufacturing under GMP conditions to make sure the product is consistent, uniform, and reproducible. In the in vivo context, what you're doing is taking molecular scissors with the barcodes and infusing them into the patients and directing them to the organs of interest to then do the edit inside the body. And, and in those cases, one of the key challenges the industry is trying to overcome at this point is delivery. How do you deliver these molecular scissors and make sure they go to the right organ of interest make the edit they're supposed to make and not make edits anywhere else and then inactivate or turn off after they've made the edit. And that delivery challenge is something where we're standing on the shoulders of giants where the same delivery technologies developed for siRNA and other modalities could come into play for gene editing as well. Beyond that, I think all the challenges are what the typical challenges of drug development, pharmacology to make sure you're getting the intended effect, safety, to make sure you're actually you know, not causing any adverse uh, reactions or any adverse effects from these drugs. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, we want to monitor these patients once we uh, get them into the clinical trials over a longer period of time because of the power of this technology, which is that it can be a one-time administration and be potentially curative. And I think that's a lot of the excitement behind this technology, at least for a lot of the patients that I've talked to, particularly those who are dealing with uh, very devastating diseases like sickle cell disease, which your company is making a product for, the potential to cure. But again, with uh, some of the technical challenges you discussed are some safety concerns. Now, I wanted to ask you, given some of the recent reports about uh, certain kinds of gene editing maybe affecting tumor suppressors genes inside of cells, what are, the what are the real safety concerns and how are you guys going to address those? Yeah, it's, it's an important question. You, you know, I think over the last two years, what we've seen is like clockwork, every six months or so, a new paper comes out of academia around the use of CRISPR-Cas9 and the potential safety concerns, and you see a big reaction in the market, uh, not just from, from investors, but also from potentially, uh, you know, the broader public. Um, I think academia has a role to play in this important therapeutic modality in surfacing these issues. And I think it's right of these academics to publish these papers. Now, but each of those papers then need to be taken in context. You know, there was a publication on off-target effects, which turned out to be largely a red herring in the sense that, you know, the off-target happened because of the experimental conditions or the, the models used for that publication. In this particular instance, last month, we had a paper come out which said that if you have gene editing in cells that are pluripotent stem cells, 
or other kinds of cells, there is a chance that you may overexpress cells which have uh, which are deficient for tumor suppressors. While it's a plausible uh, theory, I think you have to contextualize where this is applicable. For our lead program, for example, in sickle cell disease, where we do gene disruption at a very high efficiency, this effect doesn't come into play because you don't have a selection bias for the cells that are edited. For cells that have high rates of correction but are terminally differentiated, like T cells, where tumor suppressor cells are quieted down or they're in a quiescent mode, this doesn't is not very applicable, right? There, it's hard for me to think of applications, but where there are applications where you're dealing with pluripotent stem cells, where the patient may have a P53 deficiency, and then you have an editing rate that's very low, the five to 10 percent range, and you're conferring a persistence advantage by doing the editing, you're likely, you know, that it's plausible that you see some overexpression or over-indexing of cells that are deficient for this tumor suppressor mechanism. I know it's a lot of technical jargon here, but I think all said and done, I think that paper, while the, the data are valid, apply in only certain cases. And in those cases where it's applicable, in a small fraction of cases where it's applicable, I think we would have to do all the necessary testing to make sure that that effect is not seen in the drug product that we actually give to patients. And there are many ways to look at it. And in fact, we do broad-based testing to make sure there's no safety issues. Uh, and this is one part of that testing. And CRISPR being one modality to sort of change gene expression and traditional gene therapy being another, uh, are some of the safety issues with traditional gene therapy and CRISPR gene editing shared, or are there differences? And what, what do you see as the future as you have different approaches uh, like gene therapy versus gene editing towards treating a common disease? Yeah, well this may be uh, counterintuitive to some, but I think CRISPR has the potential to make these therapies much safer because Fundamentally, you're using a very directed approach as opposed to a stochastic approach, right? What you're doing is making a precise edit at the location you want to edit and nowhere else. And with that, it's a very deterministic modification that you're making, whether in the cells or in the organs of interest. Gene therapy, I, I think, has tremendous potential. Um, and there are two different ways of using gene therapy. One is with integrating vectors and the other with non-integrating vectors. The issue with the integrating vectors, uh, while they may be safe in the, in the trials done so far, they're not as directed, right? You, you have a general insertion of these uh, viral genomes that carry the payload in various parts of the genome. And with that come inherent risks, but also uh, concerns around durability of efficacy. With the non-integrating, vectors, you do have the, essentially the same issue around durability because they may not persist for very long in the cells that they have actually gone into. So I think gene therapy is great and I think it's actually ushered in the era of genetic medicines more broadly. Uh, gene editing is just that much more of an elegant uh, and very precise tool which has the potential to be safer, but that said the proof's going to be in the pudding and we have to actually do the clinical trials, first get them, get these therapies to clinical trials, do the clinical trials, and prove that they're in fact very safe and actually at the same time very effective. So as your company is moving forward and pressing the envelope to get these uh, this uh, gene editing technology into clinical trials, what is the role of the patients that this, this these treatments will affect? What is their role in that process in your mind and how can you engage the populations that will be most affected by your therapies? As we move into these advanced therapies, I think the patients, uh, and by extension in some cases parents, are going to have an oversized role because we're doing, we're making manipulations or edits that are could be one time but potentially irreversible in some cases, and and serious uh, manipulation of of your genome, and a patient is not just signing any other consent form on a clinical trial. This is a very uh, important thing for the patients to fully buy into. Um, I think patients, one, have a role in understanding the disease and education is a big part of it. 
and making sure that they understand what they're getting into in clinical trials. But more importantly, I think the patients have a broader role in catalyzing the system. Uh, I've said before that it's gonna take an ecosystem to bring these therapies. In fact, the word I use is shepherd these therapies into the clinic and through the clinic. And it takes not just the companies, but it takes the regulators, it takes the payers, uh, the government, to bring these in a safe and effective manner. And I think patients so far have had a sort of this catalytic role to bring these parties together because you then get a real sense of what patients are going through. How are you thinking about risk benefit? It's, it's very different to do risk benefit analysis in an actuarial sense, looking at numbers versus looking at a patient and saying, gosh, this patient's living through pain, living through, you know, faces potentially early death. And then your choices, you know, may become different in how you think about these therapies. And so we've been in the, making efforts to reach out to patients, educate patients around these therapies and make sure there's no, you know, there's inherent suspicion around some of the advanced therapies to, to make sure we, they fully understand what we're doing and, and, and how we're doing it. And uh, ultimately we hope to catalyze the patient community to become champions with therapy. Uh, all that said, we wanna bring these in, into the clinic with safe, in a safe and effective manner and in high quality manner and uh, our efforts are directed towards that um, while bringing the patients along on the journey. So given the power of, of gene editing technology, the actual ability we now have to change or edit a genome, what are some of the ethical concerns that we have to think about uh, as the technology moves forward? And what are some of the things that we as a society well, will need to know and discuss to make sure everybody feels comfortable about how the field is moving forward? Yeah. I, I think I'd compartmentalize that question into two parts. One is somatic cell editing and germline editing, right? With somatic cell editing, you're basically, it's not a heritable edit, and you're making an edit in the patient's body uh, to provide a cure for a certain disease. I think everyone would agree that with somatic cell editing, when there's important diseases to be cured, there's not an ethical question. I think you wanna make sure it's safe and effective, but from an ethical perspective, everybody deserves an equal chance to live and, and have the dignity of a, a productive life. And so for those efforts, which our company is focused on, uh, it's not as much an ethical question. I think it's, it's around safety and efficacy and bringing those to the patients in the right way. I think there's a broader ethical question around germline editing because they become heritable. And, you know, there's been a notion of, you know, some of the risks that could come with that, whether people get gets in the wrong hands and people use it for things like super soldiers and those things have been quoted in the press. But I think it's still early days in terms of technology and maturation to be able to do germline editing. But that said, I think we want to get ahead of that ethical question around whether we want to use it in medicine or not. And it's not just a US centric question. This is a global question and many different governments and, and, and leaders around the world are, are actively debating that question. Uh, and the NIH and the National Academy of Sciences obviously came up with a position paper around germline editing. The, the question is, you know, should you do something that's heritable, that potentially changes lineages? And, you know, there are parallels that we can draw. I mean, there are, you know, some of the vaccines and what you've done is actually fundamentally changing genetics, right? You've, you've changed evolution in a certain way of these germs and and, uh, and potential diseases have been cured because of that or, or prevented. Uh, there are in vitro fertilization techniques which potentially change the balance um, in, in some ways. But I think this one is a direct modification that could have tremendous implications uh, for what you're doing to the germline and the human population. And I would urge utmost caution uh, as we approach this question. I think we need to first make sure that science is there, the quality, of, uh, we fully understand what we're doing. Even the simple edits that we're doing in, in differentiated cells are not always easy to do. So, you know, how do we get there in terms of the technology? But at the same time, is that something we want to do as society? Uh, whether it's to prevent diseases uh, completely or it's to, it's to enhance a human body in any way or for other applications. And I, I, I would urge broader dialogue than just the folks involved in the industry and the 
and the regulators associated with it to make that decision for society. Yeah, we're excited here at DIA to be part of uh, a neutral forum that can be part of that broader dialogue and making that dialogue even broader. My last question for you, Sam, is as you're developing this technology and it's so cutting edge and so new, how do you feel that the relationship and the communication between you and international and, and national regulators will, will have to uh, be um, uh, enacted? What do you, what do you feel are, are the, the pain points and the things that you need to, the, to, to do to move forward? Yeah. Uh, Thank you for uh, asking the question also for this forum because I think the DIA can have a very powerful role in this uh, whole dialogue because it creates a forum for exchange uh, and there are not many other forums that exist that where people can do that. Um, I think most importantly, I think everyone needs to be educated and baseline in the same fashion. I think, uh, and the efforts need to be both top down and bottom up. You know whether it's some of the regulator, regulatory folks going to conferences to understand how the technology is moving, or top-down approaches where the European regulators organized a one full day forum to bring all the companies and the academics together to talk about CRISPR and the safety of it. Those top-down and bottom-up efforts both need to happen, and we need to have increased dialogue because it's, it, you know, it's, the regulatory framework is the same. You want to make sure things are safe and things are efficacious and the risk benefit ratio makes sense. But how you apply standards and how you think about what qualifies as safe, what are the analytical methods, what is the bar, those are all things that are being developed on both sides of the equation, right? I think the companies are trying to develop assays and analytical methods. The regulators are developing those. And I think that continuous dialogue in exchanging sort of that information uh, and some sort of standardization is important. I think what we, you know, what we don't want happening is a bar that's not fair, right? I think one of the great things about CRISPR is there's a lot of hype and we actually benefit from getting more funding to do our research. But at the same time with all that hype, you know, there is this general scare around CRISPR as well. And, you know, there have been standards applied to gene therapy and other modalities which in some ways are less precise than something like gene editing, you know, shouldn't be different standards applied to gene editing. I think you want to make sure things are safe and you want to be cautious around it, but what is the right bar and how do we standardize that and educate everybody around it uh, is what's required and the IA plays a big part in it. We're glad to be here and thank you so much, Sam, for your time. We're looking forward to working with you to continue the dialogue and really appreciate you being with us here today. Thank you, Shaka. Thank you.